11. This week we continue our message, Principles for Living as Fathers of Christ. And um, this section of Acts, this is the second chapter, really answers the question, is Jesus who he says he is? Is Jesus who he says he is? Well, this section answers it with a resounding yes. The, no one can answer that question, is Jesus who he says he is, but you. Your mom can't do it for you, your dad can't do it for you, your kids can't do it for you, your grandparents, I can't do it for you, Mike can't do it for you, Sarah can't do it for you, Don can't do it for you. The church can't do it for you. You have to answer that. That is the question for human beings, all humanity. Uh, you have to answer it for yourself, and if you don't answer it, if you delay, if you ignore that question, is Jesus who he says he is? You've answered. You've answered it. So what's going on in our reading today? What's all that about? That was a lot. Thank you. I like to throw the hard words to pronounce at all the, the um, students. In, in today's reading, what was going on in the context of, in Jerusalem? They were in Jerusalem, and it was very busy because uh, what happened was people from all over the Mediterranean world were there to celebrate what's called the Feast of Pentecost. In fact, I've got a map. Go back to that map. All the green, and in fact, even all the blue. You can see some of the words that Kaylee read, you know, Mesopotamia, Media, Pontus, Bilegria, Cyrene, Libya. Uh, that's where people had come from. And they've come to Jerusalem to celebrate this big festival. And it was in the spring, and it celebrated the uh, beginning of the wheat harvest. And you need to know three things to understand the Feast of Pentecost. Three things. Number one, it was a pilgrim festival. What's a pilgrim festival? Well, a pilgrim festival uh, means that, uh, that Jewish law dictated that every adult Jewish male had to go to Jerusalem and be present. That was part of the law. If you were a good Jew, if you obeyed the law, then you had to be there. They had to personally be in attendance. Number two was a holiday. No school. Shops were closed. School was out. No work. It was party time. And it happened in the spring. We kind of do the same thing during what? Spring break. Maybe this was the very first spring break. Third thing. There were certain sacrifices that, which had to be made during this festival, this festival of Pentecost. This, um, each adult male in attendance, they had to bring two fresh, freshly baked wheat loaves of bread made out of wheat from their fields, because everybody was a farmer, as ag, um, agrarian culture. And they had to offer it at the temple, give it to the priest. And uh, it had to be, they, that was required. You know, the festival of Pentecost was also called the Feast of Harvest, the Feast of Weeks. And as you read scripture, you'll see it, you, all those three used interchangeably. So here we are. That was going on in Jerusalem. It was like spring break in Daytona Beach. The disciples were there. And God decides to use that time to pour out his Holy Spirit. Streets were clogged, thousands of pilgrims, every possible part of the, you know, that, the known world at that time. So why did God choose that time to pour out his Holy Spirit? Principle number one. God cares about timing. God cares about timing in your life. God cares about timing in my life. God cares about timing in our life together. God not only cares about you, what happens to you,
but he also cares about when things happen to you. It's part of readiness. Do you know the concept of readiness? If you're an educator, you know the concept of readiness. Sometimes we're just not ready to learn something. Sometimes we're taught stuff, but we don't think it applies to us, so we ignore it. You know? When you were sitting in math class and they were doing spreadsheets or they were doing accounting, and you may or may not have paid attention but as soon as you were hired and the boss gave you a spreadsheet and an accounting program to work, then you said to yourself this, I wish I would have paid attention. Readiness. God cares about you being ready. Ready to hear what he has to say. I love this little poem. It says, God is seldom early. But he's also never late. Waiting takes a little patience, but it's always worth the wait. See, when the Holy Spirit was given to Jesus' followers, it caused a real stir there in Jerusalem. I mean, it just turned over the apple cart. It upset everything. It was something that had never, ever happened before. Um, But... It was an event that was predicted, foretold, prophesied about throughout all of the Old Testament. Uh, The outpouring of the Holy Spirit was something that the good Jews, people that knew God and loved God, uh, wanted more than anything else. And as the news spread around the city, what happened was people said, well, where's that happening? And they walked there. They ran down those cobblestone streets and and wanted to be where the disciples were so that they could be part of that. God was doing something new, something that he hadn't done in a long, long time. Israel had always said, yeah, with the Old Testament prophets, God stopped pouring out his Holy Spirit upon us, and we hope that that we can, you know, just be good enough, just be righteous enough for him to do that again. So when they heard, hey, something's going on. It's like uh, if you're driving down 295 and there's an accident, what happens? People stop and look at it. So as they gathered around the folks and they heard what was going on, they were amazed, astonished, astounded, and even confused. They'd never seen anything like that before. And they marveled with wonder. So what exactly was going on, Jim? Well, let me, let me share it with you. Uh, think about, okay, we're in Jerusalem for the Festival of Pentecost, the Festival of Weeks, the Festival of, of uh, um, um, the Harvest. And People from all over the Mediterranean world were there, okay? They were required by the law. And there was a small followers of this this, um, uh, Christians. They weren't called Christians yet. They were followers of Jesus. And uh, they were there, and they began speaking about God in the language of all the other people who were gathered in Jerusalem. Now, you might say, well, it's not uncommon for people to know a bunch of languages, but you've got to understand, there was no formal education system then. You can imagine how confusing it was. Um, what was happening to these people? Really and truly, if you were there, you would say, what's going on with them? Are they crazy? Have they gone insane? Are they speaking gibberish? I don't recognize Parthian. Are they even drunk? Have they been drinking all night? Are they coming off of a bender? (laughs) A binge? Or was God doing something? Was this the hand of God? That brings us to principle number two. When God does something, others will not understand. 
When God does something, other people will not understand. They might even oppose it. People will not understand when you're following God's plan for your life. Uh, God may ask you to do something that makes people think you're crazy, you're high, you're drunk, you're stoned. Do it anyway. Let me give you an example. Giving a percentage of your income to the church is a perfect example. It makes no financial sense whatsoever in the eyes of the world. If you practice that spiritual discipline, people will think you're crazy. You're stupid. You're foolish. But God has another opinion about it. He says, you want to grow in your faith? You want to really trust me? Give. And so we who want to grow in our faith and want to really put ourselves out there and trust God, we do it anyway, despite what others say. So this, you, we're here in Jerusalem. This, this big crowd is gathered. And who stands up? Peter, of course. And he, he, he wants to tell everybody what's going on. I mean, he's heard people say, man, they're crazy. They've lost all their marbles. They're high. They're drunk. They're... Uh, you may be thinking to yourself, well, I did when I read this. Why, why Peter? I mean, why not James, Jesus' brother? Why Peter? Wasn't Peter the one that was often wrong but never in doubt? Wasn't Peter the one that was brash and bold? And wasn't Peter the one who more often than not said things that he later regretted? Wasn't Peter the one who, you know, after Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, denied Jesus three times? Not once, not twice, but three times? Wasn't Peter the one whom the resurrected Lord himself questioned him Not once, not twice, but three different times. Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? That leads us to principle number three. God may use the most unlikely people. God may use the people you do not expect. God may use the people you do not like. God may use the people you do not respect. God may use the people you have given up on. Now, if we had to reverse that, to look at it, Have you ever felt like you've made such a bad mistake or mistakes that God could never use you, forgive you? That you're beyond hope, restoration? Maybe you struggle with something that's coming up over and over and over again in your life. You feel bad about it, but you keep doing it. Maybe you've got a hurt that you just can't let go of, find peace with. Maybe you've got something that's hanging you up. Well, if if you felt like, man, I'm beyond all hope, or, or God couldn't forgive me of that, then I would say this. You don't know your Heavenly Father very well. No matter what you've done, what sins you've committed, God can and will forgive you if you ask. All you have to do is ask. Remember a story about this uh, young pastor starting a church and this lady walks up to him and she says you know pastor god's been speaking to me and i just wanted to share it with you and he thought wow she's crazy (laughs) 
she's a nut job. And he kept putting her off and putting her off and putting her off. And finally, he got fed up. And so she came to him and said, God's speaking to me, and I want to share it with you. And he said, okay, well, uh, well before we meet, we'll do this. Go and ask God, what sin did I commit in college? What's the one thing that I did that, you know, has been with me all these years? She wanted to test to see if she was true or just crazy. So she did, and she came back, and they sat down, and the first question out of his mouth was, okay, wh what did God tell you? And she said, you know, I, I, I did talk to the God about that, and um, he told me this. He said, God said that when you ask him to forgive you, he did. And now he doesn't remember what it was. You, however, have never forgiven yourself. You see, God can use anyone and everyone, and the whole and the broken, the righteous and the sinners, for his kingdom. God can even use sinners like you and I. You know, and often it's not our sin that gets in the way of our being used by God. Often, it's our inability to forgive ourselves that gets in the way of us being used by God. You know, we hold on to sin, and we hold on to poor choices. We, uh, we hold on to our mistakes. We hold on to our lapses in judgment, and we use that against ourselves. We have a lot to learn about forgiving. Not only forgiving others, but also forgiving ourselves from our Heavenly Father. God may use the most unlikely people to teach you how to do that. So, so picture the scene in your mind. Thousands have gathered. Peter stands up. He starts by quoting the Old Testament, the prophet Joel, which Kaylee read. You see, everybody knew about the prophet Joel. They, it was well known to them. In fact, good Jews, they put their hope in that. The, the hope in the, that, those writings. They hoped that one day God would once again pour out his Holy Spirit upon his people, like he did of old, like he did way back when, like he did for their ancestors. God would just pour out his spirit upon the people, and people would be able to, to know him in a new way and uh, grow in their faith and get close to him and uh, have an intimate relationship with him. So what was most surprising to those thousands that had gathered was not was God was doing that right now, right then, right there. But who God was giving his Holy Spirit to? That was the most shocking of all. God wasn't pouring out his spirit upon all the good Jews that were there gathered, being obedient, good Jews, following their religion, there to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. God wasn't pouring his spirit out upon those people. He was giving it to this little small band of followers of Jesus, men and women who were there. You know, that was a game changer. That was astonishing. That was a shocker. That was surprising. That was scandalous. That God was pouring out his spirit upon these folks. Why? Because it meant that they had been wrong. They had been wrong. They had been wrong about Jesus. They had been wrong about who he was. They had been wrong about what he came to do. They had been dead wrong. Ever been there? Or you realize you did something big, small, whatever. Do you realize you were wrong? Well, I have. It's very humbling. Uh, and that leads us to principle number four. The Old Testament points to Jesus and tells us Jesus is who he says he is. 
The Old Testament points to Jesus. Peter makes it clear while he was on earth, all that he said, all that we, he did, all the miracles, wonders, signs, all pointed, showed, demonstrated, exposed, indicated, revealed that he is who he says he is. He is God's one and only son. Came to earth. Jesus is Lord. What does that mean? He's the supreme authority, the master, God himself. The one that we are to obey, listen to, follow, submit to. He's God himself. Part of the Holy Trinity. There at all of creation, when God said, let there be light, he was there. He is Christ. Uh, I need to clear something up about this, this phrase. Um, Christ is not Jesus' last name. Some people actually think it is. What is Jesus' last name? Christ? No, it's not. Christ is a title. Christ means God's anointed one. Christ means the Messiah, the Savior. Uh, Christ means the chosen one of God. His suffering and his death he tells us who he is. Why? Because God ordered and ordained and allowed all that to happen. The jealous Jewish leaders who instigated the plot against Jesus to have him arrested, brought before Pilate, beaten, taken to... Um, uh, Calvary nailed to a cross where he died. The Roman government who just turned their backs on it, let it all happen. All part of God's plan. All part of the plan. And, 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 and here's the interesting part. They didn't even know that. They weren't saying, Lord, let your will be done in my life. Well, Father, I want to follow you. No, they were following their own way, but God still used it. Because God can use anybody and everybody to fill his plan and purpose in your life. People you don't trust. People you don't respect. People you've given up on. It was God's plan to raise Jesus from the dead from the very beginning. Old Testament tells us about that. That was a beautiful song that Mike and the band sang, Glorious Day. It says this, death could not hold him. The grave could not keep him from rising again. Why? Because he is Lord and Christ. He is who he says he is. So we've been in Jerusalem. Thousands of people are there. Festival of Pentecost from all over the Mediterranean world. God pours his Holy Spirit out, out on uh, the followers of Jesus. They start speaking in the languages of all the people that are there. Causes a, a real big stir. Thousands have gathered to listen. Peter tells them that, hey man, this Jesus is who he says he is. And how did they react? Well, some scoff. Oh, they're just drunk. They're crazy. Others, it says, they were cut to the heart. Cut to the heart. When was the last time you were cut to the heart? Really? Uh, the Greek literally means they were pierced, pierced thoroughly. All the way through. Brokenhearted, convicted to their very being. Their thoughts, their feelings, their mind, their emotion, all were engaged in what they were seeing and hearing. They were right there, present. 
they were so overwhelmed, they didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to respond. They didn't know how to act. Have you ever been there? You just don't know what to do, what to say, how to act. leads us to principle number five we receive god's forgiveness and holy spirit when we repent and are baptized into his church they asked peter what they should do peter said two things first repent repent what does that mean well it means it it simply means to turn from just to turn from it simply means to change your direction. You're going this way, you go that way. You're going that way, you go this way. Uh, it, uh, rep- turn from, change direction. It, it simply means just to do a 180. That's what repent means. Uh, it simply means uh, to think differently, to act differently. You and I repent when we turn from our self-ruled life, trying to do things our own way, our own rules. And when we turn from that, we have to turn to something. So we turn to Jesus and embrace his plan, his will, his ways. That's what repentance is all about. You know what you're struggling with? Not good. So you repent from it. You turn from it. The second thing he says is be baptized in the name of Jesus. Now, baptism is an important um, sacrament in the Christian faith. It represents repentance. It represents turning to God for forgiveness, removal of our sins. Uh, It represents dying to our old self, rising to new life in Christ. Signifies our spiritual union. Uh, with Christ and his church. It marks our adoption into God's family as adopted children. It's it's an outward sign and seal of an inward spiritual reality. Um, It's how we begin our relationship with God. We repent and we uh, are baptized in the name of Jesus. You see, to do any of that, It takes two attributes. Well, one attribute. Humility. It takes humility to repent. It takes humility to submit to baptism in the name of Jesus. And yet that's how God wants us to respond. Repent. Repentance is not necessarily about feeling sorry. It could be or could not be part of it. It's a decision to turn away. And it takes humility to say, yeah, I have a problem. I need to turn away. Submitting to baptism publicly takes humility. Do you know how many of you would ever stand up here and speak? Less than probably 7%. Greatest fear in most adults' lives is what? Speaking in public. You see, what Jesus did on the cross and by rising from the dead is a one-time event in all of history one time once and for all the cross once and for all to this very day we mark time by the birth of jesus we're 2015 years from what the birth of christ history is really his story what jesus did by dying on the cross being raised from the dead all part of God's plan, talked about for thousands of years throughout the Old Testament, all the way through the New Testament to this very day. It's an ongoing story. It's for you, 
right now, it was for your grandparents, it was for your parents, it's for you, it's for your children, it's for your great-grandchildren. It's for those who feel really close to God and those who feel so far away, they, they, are, they feel lost. It's for those of you who want to get close to God and, and those who don't. The cross is for everyone, all of us. You see, this issue is Jesus. Who he says he is is not going to go away. Uh, you have to deal with it. Your children have to deal with it. Your grandchildren have to deal with it. Your parents have to deal with it. Your grandparents, your great, everybody who's ever lived has to deal with it has to face it. And we've got some choices to make. We can either deal with it in a way in which we're going to receive reconciliation with God, forgiveness, true forgiveness of our sins, meaning and purpose in our life, abundant life on this earth and eternal life when we die. That's one way to deal with it. A lo it takes humility to de deal with it that way. Or we're going to deal with it in the other way, in which we'll experience continued guilt, shame, continued separation from God, little meaning and purpose, and eternal separation from our Heavenly Father when we die. And that takes no humility to deal with it that way. I don't know about you, but I don't want anyone that I know to experience the second one. Especially those I love. What would happen if we made a commitment today that when people are around you and me, it's going to be hard for them to go to hell. That leads us to principle number six. Your time, my time, your children's time, your grandchildren's time, your parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, all of our time on this earth is all about Jesus. Let me share with you some of his own words. John 14, 6 says this. He said, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the way. He's the way to get close to God. He's the way to discover God, to connect with God. You know, you can't be good enough to earn God's love, forgiveness, grace, and mercy. You can't earn your way to heaven. You have to go through Jesus. You have to deal with this issue. Is he who he says he is? Jesus is the truth. He, he shows us who God is, what God is like. If we want to know the truth of God, we have a person to look at, and that person is Jesus Christ. If we want to know God intimately and closely and, and have a relationship with God, we have to go through Jesus Christ because he reveals the truth of God, the truth of you, the truth of me, the truth of all humanity. And Jesus is the life. The only way to experience abundant life on this earth, eternal life when we die, is by putting our faith and our hope and trust in Jesus Christ. Salvation is found nowhere else. So how about you? Today you had to really ask yourself, do you want a refreshing, active, inspiring spiritual life? Do you want a spiritual life that just pops and jumps and does some great things for you, gives you meaning and purpose? If so, get to know Jesus Christ. Repent. Be baptized in his name. Let me sum this up. We looked at six principles today. God's timing's always right. God does something others will not understand. 
God can use the most unlikely people. The Old Testament points to Jesus. He is who he says he is. We receive God's forgiveness and the Holy Spirit when we repent and are baptized in this church. And your time here on this earth is all about Jesus. So if we were to make those things personal so that we can take them with you, how would you do that? What would it look like for you to act on these principles? What would that look like in your life, in my life? Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you and praise you for Jesus the Christ, what he did on this earth, what he did by dying on the cross and being raised from the dead, what you did through him. Help us to just face that, embrace that with all of ourselves. Help us set aside those things that pull us down and keep us from experiencing life in all its abundance. We thank you and we praise you for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray and all God's people said, Amen. In worship, we always respond. God asks us to respond. To ignore is to answer the question. To delay is to answer the question. How are you going to respond? We respond by giving. God calls each and every one of his followers to Christ to give proportionately um, a portion of their income. And that's how we do it. And so in obedience to God, we continue our worship by giving his tithes and our offerings, giving proportionately to God out of his blessings in our lives. So uh, as the ushers come wait before us, let us give as an act of worship. We're going to do something a little different. We're going to ask you to remain seated as our, not only our ushers, but our elders come forward and let us have our prayer of thanksgiving as we remain seated. Father, we do thank you for the gift and the giver. We ask, Lord, that you just uh, pour out your Holy Spirit upon this offering. Bless the gift and the giver and use it. Use this, this offering to spread the good news of what you are have done and are doing in Jesus Christ. For it's in his name that we pray this prayer and all God's people said, amen. We're going to do something different. We're going to actually have our congregation meeting right now. Um, And so all of our elders are here. here